Hey, as the saying goes, winning is a great deodorant. The Sixers getting the W at the start of their three-game West Coast road trip. Hey, welcome to the Sixers Talk podcast. So glad you could join us. Danny Pommels, along with Noah Levick, our NBC Sports Philadelphia.com writer extraordinaire, as well as Ben Barry, our producer in the cut, doing his thing. And uh, welcome. So glad you could join us. Let's talk about this West Coast road trip. And hey, winning cures all, Noah, and the Sixers get a W despite the LeBron-less Lakers trying to hawk them down at the end there. Some careless turnovers, but the Sixers, an excellent free-throw shooting team, as well as having a comfortable lead that they could hide behind there down the stretch. Um, we, we got to see Maxi in closing time once again. And, um, man, I, it just I really am starting to get to the point where when he squares those feet, and his shoulders up to the basket and rises and fires. I'm expecting it to go in, though, because it's just like he's uh, similar, you know, I slow down on the comparisons, but similar to Ray Allen or good shooters in that way where the body and everything mechanically looks exactly the same on every shot. And uh, the beautiful high arcing layup and the three pointer when it mattered, it was just good to see him rise to the occasion when the team needed him. Absolutely. Uh, he seems to enjoy those spots where he can slam the door shut on another team's potential surge or, or comeback. With the outside shooting, which is for me, I'm noticing more and more uh, the, the variety is, is so great and so, um, you know, much more diverse than, than what it was last year. We saw him last night hit a transition catch and shoot three from the corner when uh, Joel Embiid led the break. And, of course, we see now off the dribble when opponents play deep drop coverage, as someone like Dwight Howard needs to, uh, and there is space. Not only is he shooting without hesitation, but as you said, the mechanics are really consistent and everything just seems very comfortable. But, it, you know, from the corners, from the wings, catch and shoot, off the dribble, the sidestep. Side step, right. Yeah, the step back. Uh, and the sidestep, you know, relatively new and all of a sudden it's this rather large weapon in his game all of that yeah continues to be very impressive and uh, continues to emerge as you know a big deal for the Sixers late in games uh, that when he's got catch and shoot opportunities he's pretty reliable uh, when Embiid or Harden are double teamed and then he can also create those long range looks on his own but overall as you captured it wasn't the Sixers finest performance by any means and I think I agree with the the overall point that most wins are good wins in the NBA but if some of these injury scares that Harden and Embiid had um, had turned out worse I don't think we'd be talking much about the Sixers winning the game so um, I think the Sixers you know are certainly relieved that James Harden going down in pain and holding his right leg on, on a drive in the third quarter, um, he says, you know, was not something serious as opposed to uh, an injury that could have, you know, sidelined him for the long term. Um, so good that those guys were back out there last night and good that they completed the game despite some of the worrisome moments um, that, that both had in L.A. And particularly for uh, recovery's sake, they're not flying. They're staying in L.A. to play the Clippers on Friday. So treatment and whatnot can take on a more conventional approach where the team is in the same place and maybe there's in the hotel room at the arena type of stuff that can go on, which they don't have to travel in order to do so. And, you know, uh, James saying after the game, they got need in his quad. Uh, part of the reason why he stayed down and hopes to get treatment to be better for Friday uh, no problem with the team being cautious here and making sure that, you know, he's ready to go as opposed to, you know, maybe in the playoffs where you would, you know, fight your way through, you know, being borderline or what have you. Um, Joel Embiid also, uh, you know, dealing with the lower back soreness. We saw him stretching the back out. We saw him grimacing. We saw him, you know, grabbing at the back, but came out in the second half and, and still played well. We saw him talk about that in uh, James and Joel's joint press conference uh, a couple of games ago that, hey, everybody's got, you know, ailments and injuries and stuff like that. Do I feel as great as I ever had? No, but at the same time, I'm still good enough to go. And 
sometimes it feels like, you know, when James gets injured like that and he's having a bad game, it just really just exacerbates some of the, you know, inadequacies or the way the team is flowing or what have you. But Joel, the steadying uh, force there, as well as Tyrese Maxey, the steadying, for- steadying force. And it just seems more and more, particularly as we put these last two games together, plus, you know, the body of work from earlier in the season that Maxey's looking more and more like a closer. Like if, if you guys don't want to shoot it or, you know, uh, rise up in a big moment, I'm going to be there to to shut the door, like you said. And it, it just continues to be another dynamic of who he is and what he can provide for this team, though. Indeed, yeah. I think Joel Embiid put up 30 and 10, but he, he didn't play that well by his standards. Mm-hmm. Uh, and Dwight Howard had his best game in a while. Uh, so tipping the cap to Embiid's former backup. His 24 points were the most he scored since 2018 when he was a member of the Washington Wizards. And the Lakers, uh, without LeBron James and without Anthony Davis, don't have a lot of firepower, although surprisingly, Stanley Johnson uh, provided a good chunk of uh, scoring pop in that first quarter, knocked down three threes, and uh, took advantage when the Lakers played small ball and the Sixers kept him beat on the court and uh, buried a couple long range shots. But I think he just sensed all game, even if the Sixers weren't as engaged as usual or weren't playing their best basketball, especially defensively, uh, they just had so much more talent and, and they were likely to pull this one out. Um, but definitely great that Maxi, uh, you know, continues to thrive in those, in those late game spots. And, you know, we've talked about just the common sense strategy for defenses is blitz James Harden and double team Joel Embiid and just, uh, put the burden on other players to come through. And I think, of course, your confidence level that Maxi can do that is growing. Uh, I think last night was interesting in that we, again, saw some rotation tweaks and the Sixers are now trending in that direction where um, they they are playing with zero All-Stars on the court, or at least that's what they did, you know, for a stretch last night. Um, and... Perhaps Maxi can make those lineups, you know, perform okay. Um, I think there are reasons for some optimism there, even if there's inevitably probably going to be some shakiness uh, when you don't have your two, you know, all-star talents on the court. Yeah, and also um, in Harden's case, at least they're not playing like all-stars because he just starts off the game really cold. Uh, the three-point shot isn't falling. Thank God for that third quarter. But, you know, I, I just see opportunities for James to shoot some open shots that he doesn't, and maybe that's because his shot wasn't falling. He figured he'd get other guys involved. But um, that, that continues to be a great aspect of his game. But I didn't anticipate that his tenure would be uh, him turning down open shots in order to pass and set other guys up. Um, which, you know, we keep, we talked about the balance and what he's trying to figure out a few times on the podcast, but just a little curious how that plays out as they try to balance the minutes that he's playing, as well as him getting into the postseason on a high note and, you know, him being in good rhythm and flow with his game. And it definitely isn't quite there yet uh, from, from watching him, you know, night in and night out. And he's trying to figure things out. But the turning down the open shots, I, I just sometimes just feels a little uncomfortable to me. Are you noticing that? And, and do you feel like, um, you know, just from listening to James, that he's in a good place with how that is coming together? Yeah, I think he's been pretty consistent in recognizing that when the games are high stakes, the team needs him to be aggressive. But also that isn't always solely about how many shots you take. It's about attacking and putting the defense in uncomfortable spots. And yeah, I agree. He, he hasn't done a great job of that overall the past you know, week or so. Uh, and you'd like to see some improvement there, you know, before the playoffs begin. But I think last night he, he goes, I think two for 10 in that first half. And honestly, probably was the smart move not to shoot the team out of the game. Right. It's like, it's a lot worse if he's three for 15. Um, 
he didn't have it going and at least to some extent seeded potential shots to players who were more likely to score the ball and that you know was i think fair enough and the sixers you know went down i believe like 39 32 and malik monk was cooking and then they turned things around in that second quarter despite harden not playing that well and um you know took a lead into halftime and you know became uh you know well positioned to win that game despite james harden not being uh, peak james harden uh, but as you said, the third quarter was a reminder that it doesn't take much for him to get into his zone, right? Like there were one or two layups where he just kind of bowled through contact and used his body and physicality well, and that seemed to flip a switch. And he scores uh, 16 points in that third quarter before the uh, injury scare. So um, not his not his finest game, but I'm personally not at the point where I think there's anything gravely concerning as far as the way he's playing. I think my larger concerns would just be, just be the health stuff. And uh, just last night being a reminder that even though the Sixers have two all-stars, like they can't afford to lose either of them if we're being realistic. Um, there's some tenuousness there. And even though Joel Embiid is far more durable than early in his career, uh, the Sixers, it's just impossible for me to imagine them going deep in the playoffs if uh, DeAndre Jordan or Paul Millsap or one of the young guys has to start at center because Embiid is out. And I think um, though Maxie's doing great and though the team has some other good players, you know, the, it's the same deal with James Harden. Uh, they need him on the court, playing a lot of minutes, being healthy and um they, they just got to hope they get some good luck and then also control what they can as far as uh, being cautious when is appropriate and trying to ramp up uh, as well as possible. And, you know, um, stealing some uh, thoughts from the postgame show, it, with the way that Joel started the game, Amy Fadul and Mark Jackson were uh, commenting on the fact that it really felt like a quiet 24 points from Harden. You kind of look down and all of a sudden he's, you know, uh, pushing uh, the 30 point mark. But I think Coach Lynham also made a, a great point with the the way that Tobias Harris, the way, the way his game ended up, the way Maxie's game ended up, and the other contributors, you know, Harden with his assist and his playmaking, you know, all that doesn't happen by mistake. You know what I mean? He's out there, you know, creating opportunities for guys and doing more than just scoring the basketball. So once again, the balance is going to be really key on how comfortable he can get and where the other guys can fall into, you know, that space as well. I also feel like, you know, with the way they played against the Heat and, you know, so many people didn't expect, you know, the bench guys and the non-Joel uh, and B. James Harden team to, to perform the way they did, but it was the share in the basketball that I, I really, really caught my eye. And I did still see a lot of that great passing and, whatnot um in the Lakers game when those you know Embiid and Harden weren't on the floor that has to be you know a harbinger of good things to come if they're going to play unselfish basketball which you know it doesn't matter who shoots it it's going to be a great shot because what they're doing is trying to find the best opportunity so that that has to be uh, uh something that you you look at and and think of as a feather in their cap right I agree with the the major caveat that they were playing a team that's now 11 games below 500 and didn't have an 18-time All-Star and, and Anthony Davis. Uh, but as far as play style, yeah, I think that is the way those non-Embiid, non-Harden lineups, if they indeed persist, have to play. And it's a contrast from Embiid where some of those post-ups are inevitably going to be somewhat deliberate because it's about drawing the double team and waiting yeah. for cutters and letting take advantage rest. of those situations. Yeah. And we've seen Harden uh, does pound the ball a good bit and okay. Some of it is excessive, but some of it's again, necessary to um, quarterback the gym and uh, read what the defense is doing and, and get himself in, in spots where he can, you know, get a switch or isolate or whatever. So there's going to be some, situations where the Sixers wait until late in the shot clock when their all-stars are on the floor and that's fine but uh, the ball movement from you know those other players uh, is exactly what you want to see uh, George Niang um, banged in three first quarter three so 
that made everything look a lot nicer for the um, non-all-star groups. And Furkan Korkmaz, as we assumed, remained in the rotation and uh, reached 2,000 career points, which it seems like everyone was really excited about. Um, nice little milestone. And um, yeah, he's, he's evidently still got a bit of a shot here moving forward. Um, so it is interesting just how things have shifted because with these duos, you recall it was initially uh, Harris and Harden, and now um, you know Doc Rivers is, is going in another direction and, and seeing if he Harris can lean on. Yeah. yeah, see if maybe he can lean on and beat in Harden. Uh, again, you figure that ten man rotation and extended minutes without either of your all stars on the floor, you know might be a bit risky in a, in a playoff setting, but uh, nothing wrong with experimenting though. Like uh, we, we know that the bench has not settled on good, consistent answers for what works. And um, I, I don't have any problems with exploring this, especially given all we've talked about with Maxie's growth as a shot creator and lead ball handler. And, you know, someone who can just kind of will a team through uh through a situation. So yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we'll monitor, monitor that moving forward. Uh, not a ton of time left, but 10 games and um, yeah, we'll, we'll still learn some more about this team and uh, whether it's depth can do enough if used in the right spots. There's gotta be a mad scientist approach in some aspects. You got to tinker with it. You got to shuffle the lineup a little bit. And I think, the shuffling that they're doing now is important because you get Harris, Maxi, uh, Corkmaz, and Milton on the court together. So that allows Milton and Maxi to handle the ball handling of duties and gives Corkmaz a chance to play that free flowing off the ball game that that has really gotten him to two thousand points. You know what I'm saying? Like him handling the ball was definitely a great need for the team at a certain point definitely before james harden got here but now you have him playing that off the ball catch and shoot style and that really benefits him where he doesn't have as much responsibility and can be kind of just out there you know feeling his way and, and being in motion and things like that so i think that that is a great addition um to what the sixers are trying to do here down the stretch yeah 10 games to go but uh Tyrese, um, excuse me, Tobias Harris commenting after the game, you know, you give up over 120 points to this Lakers team without LeBron and you allow Russell Westbrook and Carmelo Anthony and these guys to kind of hang around. And although the Sixers only have seven turnovers had a couple ones late that really uh, made it closer than it should have been. But the defense obviously was uh, something that the Sixers lacked so much of last night. Uh, what, what do you attribute that to? Where, where did you see the lapses for them defensively, most of all, and uh, as well as uh, any of the other things I just mentioned? Yeah, I, they just didn't seem to find it necessary to, to play with a ton of intensity in this game. And they were right. They didn't need to to win the basketball game. But obviously, we've seen them be sharper this year just with some of the basic stuff with closing out hard on good shooters or um, – you know, getting back, you know, as a team and transition or, uh, you know, rotating sharply when someone's beaten off the dribble. Well, some of those fundamentals were just lacking because the Sixers knew they could score a bunch of points was my impression. Uh, and then I just think, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Lakers had some success with small ball. Uh, you know, Dwight Howard is their only conventional uh, big man. Um, you know, Gabriel was another option. And then, as I said, we saw Joel Embiid guarding Stanley Johnson and ultimately Stanley Johnson, you know, poured in a bunch of quick points in that first quarter and, and gave the Lakers some momentum. Um, I'm not sure if that's a huge big picture concern for the Sixers, you know, whether they're capable of playing small ball, but I certainly think if opponents try to uh, put DeAndre Jordan in that spot, uh, yeah, that would be a worry. Um, mm -hmm. If DeAndre Jordan has to guard generic 6'8", six, 6'9", six, quick athletic player who shoots threes, uh, from what we've seen so far, that player is going to get wide open threes. 
and have very good looks at making said shots. Um, so we'll see how much um, you know other teams try to exploit the areas where Jordan is weakest. Um, but I think you know, his ability to be used in multiple situations, there are a great many reasons to be skeptical about that. You know, you remember with Dwight Howard last season, just the fact that Rivers basically stuck with him as the backup center in every spot, you know, it often didn't seem advisable. And you wondered whether he could have used Ben Simmons some as a small ball five or, or try uh, Tobias Harris as a five or, or sort of go like for like as opposed to staying big. Um, and I wonder how Rivers is going to approach that moving forward. Um, I don't think he's, you know, deluded in thinking that DeAndre Jordan can be great in every situation, but uh, he sure does seem to like Jordan quite a bit. And it sure does seem that uh, Jordan is, is going to play in the playoffs. I'm just wondering what that line is where it's almost undeniable of, okay, we have to try something different here. or We have to adapt to uh, the way the other team is really picking on Jordan. He's not backing down from the DeAndre Jordan minutes in any way because we continue to see, uh, you know, you have a team that's without their, you know, best player, players um, with Anthony Davis out as well, but you don't see the opportunities for these younger guys to play, you know, those center minutes. So he's obviously priming DeAndre for something and it's the postseason uh, as we wind to a close here. But uh, we'll, we'll see how that plays out. We'll get into more of this discussion on the other side. We'll talk about some film review, a great piece Noah has up on the website uh, regarding Matisse Thibault's progression and his transformation in some ways as uh, James Harden has made it onto this team, as well as uh, some more Tyrese Maxey because this guy is the gift that keeps on giving. So stay with us. We'll take a quick time out and be right back here on the Sixers Talk Podcast. Make your move in 2022. A Wilmington University education can take you where you want to go. Spring classes start January 10th. Apply today at wilmu.edu. Maxi, Maxi, Maxi. I can hear it now. I can still, the echoes of the Wells Fargo Center are still in my head, Noah. And man, uh, we see this kid before the game with all the energy, with like different handshakes for every player on the team, the hugs uh, with Sam Cassell, just the vibes and energy from this kid are just, everything you love about uh, Sixers basketball and basketball in general. And then after the game, after this performance he puts on with helping the team close out the Lakers down the stretch, he's just, you know, really revealing about how he got here and, and messages his dad uh, told him with his dad and mom in attendance at the game and just how the work that you do in the dark comes to light um, uh eventually and and just all these little nuances of who Tyrese Maxey is and um you know it, it's great to see his confidence and who he is continue to grow and I'm trying to think of a ceiling you know for this guy and uh Jason Dumas a uh, friend of the podcast uh from Kron in San Francisco and with The Athletic he said that um, you know, he was watching the game last night, it being a national game as well, and covering the Golden State Warriors, he felt like Maxi and Jordan Poole are great comparisons as young up-and-coming guys on their respective teams that have this very high ceiling and continue to impress with every opportunity they get. And I'll take it, you know what I mean? I mean, positive comparisons for Maxi can't go too far, and I just really – am uh enjoying the journey and the growth and it doesn't help hurt that he's incredible on the court but the person and the personality that he shows really just uh accentuates that even more absolutely yeah i think you know many folks would not argue with you if you went far further than jordan Poole, who but definitely in that same category of emerging young player with uh enticing potential and some some flair and firepower in his game and, and quick unexpected growth like like quickly yeah. adapting to the nba game in a way that you you know really wouldn't have expected and, and would have been fine not being that quickly adapted you would have been fine with another year of growth maybe but suddenly yeah. he's front page news yeah yeah i mean he was in a in a much kind of lower spot than maxi i mean maxi there were i guess stretches of 
couple of games here and there as a rookie where he was out of the rotation or not playing much. But um, well, he mentioned that too after the game about a conversation he had with Doc around the All Star break, right? Right. Yeah. I mean that that's they both described that as a real turning point um, in his rookie year. Just the notion that when he's on the court, he's got to attack, he's got to be aggressive, and he's he's got to shoot less floaters, even though he's more than capable with the floater and has skill with that shot uh, that he was relying on it too much. And he took all of that to heart and you know, has incorporated it quite well in, into his game. Um, I was looking up uh, before the game last night among sophomore players, it's only him, Tyrese Halliburton and Desmond Bain who are averaging 15 plus and shooting over 40% from three. I mean, those are three great young players and, <laughs> I feel quite good about the idea that uh, all three will be in this league for a long time and are performing well on playoff basketball teams. Uh, and also just last night I, I was looking, you know, at last season uh, how Maxie had performed against the Lakers and just his, you know, brief track record there. Um, he has six minutes of career experience against you know, Lakers teams that included an active LeBron James. Obviously, the Sixers, you know, do not get to face LeBron this season. But, you know, that's another indicator of just how far he's come that uh, in the two matchups against the Lakers last season, he was barely playing at all. Obviously, now he's a, a very key player uh, for the Sixers. So, uh, yeah, keeps keeps going up and up and up. Um, and, yeah, it's, it's fun to see and, and it's fun to think about all the possibilities. Speaking of other young stalwart players on this Sixers team, uh, Matisse Thibel, uh, you have a great article on the website kind of breaking down the impact James Harden has had on this game and the, the growth and progress Matisse has made this season. I, I felt like there were opportunities last night and, and have been in the past where he's uh, not using his gifts in the best ways possible, particularly when he's attacking the rim. He goes up soft sometimes and um, where – he he jumps out of the gym, so I, why he doesn't try to dunk more of these balls or attack the rim aggressively in that way and the expectation of either making a layup dunk or getting fouled, I'm not sure. But uh, there was in the first quarter like a lazy reverse layup that he thought would probably get to the rim that got swatted away. And then uh, maybe he was indecisive on another in the second half where he kind of lost the ball going to the rim where it was either – you know, maybe he didn't wasn't decided on whether to dunk or lay it up, but just I, I just really think that he would benefit more from uh, just having that mentality of like dunk, lay up, or get fouled when he's in close to the rim. Like he has athleticism and height and size that really benefit him in those close areas, but there are times where he kind of seems on the fence in that regard. But just something I noticed, but. Your article obviously goes in much more detail, and Steve Graham, shout out to him, um, one of our uh, produ producers here, uh, video producers, who just does a great job along with you on getting those pieces together. But speak to that a little bit more, please, Noah. Sure, yeah. A little context, I think, that is probably relevant with some of his struggles with the non-dunk finishing he was on uh, JJ Reddick's Old Man in the Three podcast last year, and he told a story about how in some of his early years in basketball, I think he said like seventh or eighth grade, he was like scared of taking layups because he'd get all these steals, of course, and be in the open floor and have a layup, and he couldn't make them, and it was like kind of embarrassing. And he, he said he had like a fear of of layups. You don't want to exaggerate, you know the extent to which that at all impacts part of his psyche though part of his psyche yeah, obviously he's made plenty of layups and <laughs> plenty of shots as an nba player but of course defense has always been much more natural for him and just instinctively there's not a great level of aggression around the rim uh, there's some indecisiveness and not a ton of fluidity or um, or skill when he's when he's not dunking the ball, which of course he has the ability to do spectacularly. Um, but yeah, with, just with Thibel overall, we we had a bunch of uh, Thibel content hit the website today. Um, I talked with talk with Danny Green um, one on one just because I think obviously he's got an interesting uh, thorough perspective on 
MBA 3 and D players, and also in playing next to stars, which we've, which we've talked about. Uh, and Green is, has been very involved with Thibel. Uh, there's a lot that he does both in games and practices and film sessions to try to push him in the right directions. And the way he sees it, like much of this is about balance for Thibel. So of course, defensively, it's like, when do you take risks and when do you play a little more cautious so you don't get in foul trouble? Some of that nuance. And then offensively, of course, uh, there's when you cut and when do you space out so that the stars have room to operate? Uh, you know, when do you take the open, wide open threes? And when do you uh, defer to one of the star players? How do you communicate effectively with these stars? Like these are all really fascinating questions, and, and Danny Green, I think, is uniquely equipped to answer them. He talked about absolutely playing on multiple teams in that role. Yes. Yeah. Championship yeah. teams, in fact. Yes. Yep. Three rings. Danny Green uh, looking for number four here, and he he talked about early in his career with the Spurs. He learned with um, Manu Ginobili and Tony Parker. It's very important to communicate directly and not dance around issues like. Yo, do you want me to step up or do you want me in the corner? Like, what do you need from me? Um, and he said that develops over time where, you know, if you're um, with the star and you're having those kind of conversations, then you become more familiar with each other and you learn uh, how you can best complement that, that elite talent. Uh, and he's trying to impart these things to Thibel and, and trying to help him with, with some of the details. And then also he said a big part of this is just, giving them confidence. I mean, you know, there's probably a lack of confidence at times around the room and mm -hmm. probably not as much faith as you'd like to see in his athleticism and how that can enable him to make a positive offensive impact. So Green just tries to encourage him uh, to do what he does best uh, and you know, trust that if he takes open shots and if he plays his game defensively, he's going to help the Sixers a lot. Uh, so I, I just think Thibel is a huge wild card for this team. And it, it's tough to say whether all of uh, these things he's trying to balance will pan out as the Sixers hope in the playoffs. But uh, it is at least you know, encouraging that he's done some nice things next to James Harden where you see him um, explore a little more of that athletic ability with the screening and rolling and the cutting and, um, you know, being really, really quick and explosive in transition. Uh, and maybe as he learns how to adapt to stars, um, all of that will become a little bit better. But I think it's really, you know, I have no idea. What, what Matisse Thibel is going to be in the playoffs. I wouldn't be surprised if he's a massive reason why the Sixers like win a second round series or the Eastern Conference Finals or whatever. But I also wouldn't be stunned if the fouls are costly and he loses confidence in the jumper and defenders help way off him and it's not viable to play him many minutes. Uh, there's a ton of variability with, with Thibel, but Anyway, the gist the gist of this this story is uh, Green is Green's trying to help him out as best he can, and he's not a bad bad person to have in your corner. No, absolutely not. And Matisse uh, could definitely use him as a blueprint, and definitely a bit of an enigma with what we will suspect in the postseason. I guess the lasting indelible memory, which hopefully will get erased here in this postseason, we have of Matisse is uh, Ben Simmons passing in that ball after we're going that dunk and him trying to make the most out of it but um uh, be sure to check out the article very uh, interesting and insightful as noah mentioned and uh enjoy the rest of this road trip people we will be with you again next week with another sixers talk podcast uh the clippers friday followed by the phoenix suns on the weekend um noah any uh, final thoughts before we get out of here um no yeah i'll just reiterate that Clippers game, I would expect the Sixers to play with a little more of an edge than they did against the Lakers. Um, I think I incorrectly said that the Clippers came back from 26. It was 24, but that's still a pretty big lead yeah. the Sixers lost. And it was still a pretty stunning way to, to um, be defeated at home. Uh, and yeah, so the Sixers will 
we'll hope for a little revenge there and hope to get back on track. And uh, we'll see what, as always, what the uh, injury report brings us and uh, what the deal is with Harden and Embiid's availability. But I think it is legitimately a massive sigh of relief that neither of those um, potential serious injuries, you know, seemingly were actually that bad. So two all-stars are, are still on track. And as Brett Brown uh, always said, the Sixers, you know, still have a good chance here to land the plane and uh, get into the playoffs uh, with, with the team they hope to have. Uh, where they will be in the playoffs is anybody's guess. Uh, credit to them. All they got to do is take care of their business and continue to win, and they'll be fine. But they sit in second place, a uh, log jam there with the Celtics, man, continuing to blow teams out. But the Heat are imploding at the top, so maybe they come down, and who knows how it's all going to play out. But uh, 10 games of fun for the 76ers coming up, and uh, a lot of great Eastern Conference basketball still to play. And hopefully this is the season where they put it all together and get to the the, uh, the conference finals and the NBA finals. But uh, we'll be here with you to help dissect it. We appreciate you listening here on the Sixers Talk podcast. We're brought to you by Wilmington University. Wilmu works for Noah Levick and Ben Barry. I'm Danny Carmel. We'll see you next time.